Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Screen Chronicles. I'm Steve. With me, as always, is Colbstone. And today we have a very special guest on. He's a director who's directed many works, including Critical, Pennyworth, Hearst. But if you're a fan of us, you probably know him from the works in The Last Kingdom. Uh, today we have on John East on The Screen Chronicles. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. John, me. welcome on. We're so excited to have you on. In our eyes, John, you're sort of a, a Last Kingdom legend. We uh, started thinking of like our top 10 all time Last Kingdom moments and came to realize that probably more than half of them are from episodes that you directed uh, in The Last Kingdom. So we are um, super excited uh, to talk to you today. It, it's, it's, it's more than likely just good luck that I got those great scripts to work on. And this is kind of a lottery which script you get when you when you do a season of uh, Last Kingdom. But um, I've been blessed with a few the few good ones. I know that. So uh, and I've enjoyed doing them. But I, I, I'm glad you appreciate them. Yeah. But still, like, it's got to be even even if it's a good script. I mean, like how much control you have as a director, too, has got to either highlight those moments. We're going to talk more about season five here, but I think if one of our favorite moments that you've directed and it's one of our favorite moments from the entire show was the the two part sort of part that happened in season three oh, with yes. alfred oh. and edward the decision and i mean i just oh, remember wow. yeah the, the battles going on and then it it pans into the woods and, and i imagine like the script could have just said like and it shows alfred's on his horse right um, yes but then I love the like the slow pan through the from the battle to the trees. You see oh. some soldiers up to yeah. men on horse. I mean, incredible. I'm really touched. I'm really touched at that. That that sort of yeah. I'm really touched at that bit of craftsmanship. You know, worked his magic on you. So thank you for that. Um, you know, when you, when you're filmmaking, you're directing. You just sort of. I always do what. I think well, I'd like to see that. You know, that this would excite me, and this is an interesting way to do. But you, but you you know you no real way of knowing what impact it has on the audience because by the time mm. that happens, I'm off doing another show, and you know, so those little just that little moment you just described, I'm so excited you like that because I I just want I just want to myself how can I how can I get to this army in the most interesting way, and you know, well of, of, often you know one of the main principles of filmmaking is the reveal. You know, how do you reveal something? Do you just show it? Or do you sort of tease it and then show it? You know, what do you do? You know, and I think right. audiences like to feel the thing is developing a bit like a flower opening. It's like, oh, what's inside? What's inside? You know, what's there? You know, and so with that shot, yeah, we, we sort of pan. We saw that. Uh, I remember now very vividly. We saw the we saw Uhtred and his team surrounded by uh, Heston's army. And then we pan uh, left gradually off the battlefield. Like, oh, where are we going? And you, then the first thing you found, actually, forgive me for my Urzat sword, but you sort of found a yes. hand on a sword hilt yes. that? right right and then that was and then of course you reveal the guy who's holding it it's just an ordinary grunt sort of soldier and then you go oh, there's a few more guys behind him and a few more a few more and then of course you go all the way around and then you see the whole army behind you know and there's alfred yeah. close to so it's a kind of a tease like that but so many things go into making a shot like that which might not necessarily be apparent so for example in, it's a very interesting uh, example to pick on for for, the, for how the last kingdom is conjured because you know the script said you know it's in winter they're they're fighting in the middle of a field hiding in the forest is like a 2000 strong army or something well that's that that reads great on the you know, on a page but if you really think about what a forest looks like in the middle of winter it's got no leaves right so it's right. <laughs> if you actually stand in a forest in the middle of winter you can see for about 200 yards because there's nothing to block your view you know it's just right it's just, right you know, unless the trees are so dense that you can't move between them. But any yeah. normal forest, you can just say, so the idea that an army could be hiding in the forest is like, you know, if you're on the battlefield, you just look, you turn your head and go, hey, there's 2,000 people over there. In the tree. <laughs> so it's like, how do you how do you persuade the audience that credibly these guys are hiding? So right. as, as, the, as the camera panned left off the battlefield onto the, you know, onto the guys hiding in the ditch and then, and then the mounted soldiers behind, Digitally, I actually put in a lot more branches that were really than were really there. Uh, uh, you know, we okay. moved a few in. We moved a few in, literally just on stands, kind of block a few holes. Then, but any, any other holes further down that I couldn't sort of fix, you know, or didn't have time to fix, I went. Let's just we'll just digitally put in some branches there. So, in the mind's eye, you kind of go, well, you know, there's a there's a kind of a barrier there, you know. Mm, sure, right sure. And of course, um, by the time we came to film that particular 
section of the battle. It was a long, as you say, it bridged episodes five and six. Right. When we started shooting, and we shot it more or less in chronological order, uh, and it's quite a long battle and it involved the setup of them waiting in the field and Heston arriving and yeah. encircling them and then the then the Alfred arriving. It's quite a long sequence across the you know the back of one episode and the front of another. It took that took several days to shoot. I think about five days to shoot all of that. When we started filming, uh, the snow was deep and uh, it, and it was falling and it was right. very cold. Now by the time we finished filming, uh, most of the snow had melted. And the, the, and the temperature had gone up <laughs> about four or five degrees and uh, there was nothing left, you know. So that particular shot that you were talking about happened about two thirds of the way through those days. You know, so the mo- I'd say about half of the snow had gone already uh, and it suddenly melted off the tree. Gotcha. So the snow you're seeing uh, there is a mixture of what's left. Uh, a little bit of fake snow, which we sprayed, you know, onto trees sure. at home, you know, you spray it on and stuff. Uh, and some digital snow to fill in the areas where we just couldn't have enough coverage with the with the snow gun, you know, the spray foam. So there's lots going on in that shot, which aren't ne- isn't necessarily immediately apparent. But that's kind of the trick of Last Kingdom. I suppose the last trick is, as you pan over to Alfred, uh, and he's sitting there with Stiapper and, uh, uh, and uh, Edward, Edward and the rest of the army sort of behind yeah. him. You sort of your mind sort of tells you, well, there must be an equivalent number of soldiers behind the camera, of course, because mm-hmm. it's a big long line. Sure. There's nothing behind the camera at all. You, you, know, oh. you, can't, you can't afford, you can't really afford 2,000 extras. You, you can afford 150. So sure. you sort of use the 150 most in the most strategic way that you can, you know, where the audience can determine, oh, that's a real human being. And then where they can't determine it's a real human being, they become digital, you know, so then it's digital people. Right. So there's a lot of, you know, smoke and mirrors, as they used to say, going on throughout that 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 individual shot and the whole sequence. Interesting. It's so interesting. And we totally like forgot after the first time we watched it that between episodes five and six there, that that was two different episodes because that moment was so powerful when Edward finally decides to charge. Um, and we love all of the little bits of that, the, the tension building, the quick cuts back to the fighting um, losing time and Alfred being st- as stoic as ever. And then finally, when Edward does do the charge, the, just the, the quick nod that Alfred does yeah. to stay up, but that he's the one really in charge. Yeah. It's just, oh, it's, God, you, I'm so, I'm so yeah. thrilled you pick up on these little details because you never quite know, you know, will people, will oh, people man. catch that? You know, we love that. It's got to be in our top three oh. Last Kingdom moments ever. It's, oh, yeah. it's such a, and it doesn't have anything much to do with Uchard there. It's just such a great father son, Edward breach or hold. Moment. That was well, awesome. You know, what what you have there is is the payoff of a lot of very very good writing going back over a number of episodes. Do you know what I mean a number of seasons to get to that sort of point? So you you just understand those characters. You know exactly as you said, mm. Alfred mm. Stoic as ever. You, you know you, you know he's playing a game here. He's trying to get his son to to step up to the plate. You know and, yeah. and sort of sort of mature. You know in that moment and mature so much he would defy his own father and you know and uh, and and also that shot through with great emotion and and humility. I mean we think of Alfred as a right. you know pa- powerful autocratic individual. But if you think about what he was doing in that moment, was he was actually sort of saying. It's more important at this moment that that my son is stronger than I am, or at least appear to be right. so. You know, or exactly. in himself, in himself, feel that he has the power to override me. You know, that's, that's a that's a, 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 a just well goes to the strength of Alfred's character. Beautiful. The writing is it's so it's it leaves space for your imagination because you could say, mm-hmm. is he doing this all in the service of his dream of England because he knows someone's going to have to take it on after him, you know, right. or or is he doing it because he's a really good father who wants to see his son mature or is it both or is it neither is it some other nefarious you know there's a lot of space you can really believe both you know yeah. with his character you could yeah. believe both yeah that's what i like about the writing it's not it's not you know it's not uh, closed there's room for the audience's speculation and it's it's fulfilling totally. and and rich at the you know but at the same time you can we can still have these debates a year or two on you know what i mean it's it's, oh, it's totally it's uh and that's, that's a mark of a good show. And that, that those are the sort of scripts that any director would fight to, to you know, try and work on. Yeah, and, totally. And, and speaking of just you being able to read those moments and, and the show being great and all the writing, uh, you you were the person who ended up directing the finale to the whole yeah. series of The Last Kingdom. There's a movie coming out 
But as far as the story of Uhtred getting Ben Burr, that ended season five. Yeah, um, they brought you on for that. Was there a reason why did they ask you for that? Or well, there's always, there's always a sort of you know, <laughs> all these things happen in context. So sure, to be frank, you know, the freelancer's life is one of sort of uh, lucky and unlucky timing in terms of mm. one project finishes and maybe you're lucky another project is starting or unluckily oh that's just started a few weeks ago after you finish so you can't do that one and you've got a gap in employment and, and oh something else comes up oh I'll do that you know see it, it, it's it's quite sort of fateful you know w- when you end up on, on what show and where in that show you end up you know um that said I think you know that that was a particularly challenging um duo of episodes episodes nine and ten and season sure five. It was, it was it was pretty complicated the, the producers are obviously going to be looking for someone who they know is going to be able to deliver on the complexity of that and and it will not go you know the, the train not come off the track and you know wheels come spinning off etc so yeah there's going to be a limited number of people who are going to be able to pull that off and and uh, it was lucky that i just finished um i think it was pennyworth season two mm-hmm. uh, i just finished i just became free so oh great i can go i can step right, right, right. onto the last kingdom and do that you know but but it could just it could just as easily have been that Penny would have finished two weeks later and I wouldn't have been able to do it, you know. So it's all a case of there's a bit of luck involved in these things. But no, I, I was glad to be able to do that. I mean, I, I very nearly did the first block actually, uh, oh. to, episodes one and two of season five. But then then the timing didn't work out because something that I was doing, oh, they moved their dates or something like that. Anyway, but I wasn't able to do that, so I ended up doing the end, you know. And uh, which is uh, in some ways I'm actually rather happy. That I, I was a bit annoyed at the time when, when I couldn't do the beginning, but but then actually when I saw the scripts for nine and ten, I thought, oh no, no, this is great. I could. <laughs> I can, do, I can do the big finish, you know. I'm I'm glad you did them. I'm glad you did. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was good. It was. Um, now where are we now? We're July, aren't we? Well, yeah. We finished shooting those in June of last year. Right. So it's only about a year ago that I was on that big battlefield. Yes. Uh, we we seem to be out there for for weeks and weeks and weeks. We were probably out there for about a week and a half, two weeks, uh, with the, you know Edward's army. You know, arriving at right. them and then sort of, you know, gathering their forces on the on the cliff top, and then Ethelstan riding over and presenting the challenge and riding back, and then sure, you know, that then the, eventually the, the conflagration of the, of the various armies meeting on the cliff edge. Yeah, yeah. so much it took a lot of planning, I have to say. Don't I mean, it took, about, yeah. it took about a week and a half, two weeks to shoot it, but it, it really did take several months of working out how we're going to do that and building the various things necessary. You know, I mean, you may have seen. Sure. Some of the pictures I posted, I don't know, I, I posted Instagram. Absolutely did, yeah. Thank you for posting that stuff. If anyone listening has not seen that, go to Johnny's Instagram. He's posted storyboards, sketches, models. It's amazing. Oh, yeah, lots of behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah, it's, 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 it's good, isn't it? I mean, I love seeing that stuff when, I, you know, when I'm watching shows that I like. So, <laughs> so if I've got anything yeah, I like... It's, it was such a treat to look at, you know, for us as fans. It's great. I mean, I, I always have to wait till after... The things transmitted or dropped on Netflix, or whatever. So I, I, I wait till any spoilers and stuff. But and then I actually, and then what I normally do is I normally wait another couple of weeks just mm-hmm. to make sure that everyone's actually seen it before I put the stuff out. Because otherwise, it is a bit spoilery. You know? Sure, sure. Um, there's a lot of construction involved. You know, we had to build mm-hmm. the gates of Edinburgh. We had to build them at a place where we could then the landscape was such that we could convincingly persuade through various camera angles that there was a cliff edge there. I mean, there was no cliff edge. Right. There was no- it was an open field, you know, but but it was kind of on a slight curve, the field like that, a slight hump. So okay. if you're filming here on the hump, if someone stands on the top and the camera's low, then then what's on the other side, you can't see that there's a hump. It could be a drop. You don't know because it's just a curve. Right? But at some point it vanishes. And if you put someone right on the edge, then the curve, which you can't see, you can assume is a drop. And then, of course, if you put digital effects in on other shots, you go, oh, there's a drop there, you know. So Absolutely. there's lots of shots looking towards what looks like a, some sort of a horizon. You know, there's Ethel Sam when he rides up to the uh, fortress and it announces, you know, their intention to invade. And then he rides back again as a, as a kind of a long lens panning shot, which does that. And, it, and because you've seen the cliff before, you assume he's on the cliff edge. Well, he's not. It's just on right. top of a of a hump you know but, but, <laughs> he's, on, but he's, he's right on the top and the camera's low it looks you know there's all these little tricks but but you have to work all that out beforehand you know you can't just turn up on the day and but you, you've got to have that all worked out so and you need to know you know where's the best bit of the hump of the hill uh, where are we going to build the fortress in relation to that 
Um, right. And then how far away are the trees? Because, you know, one army's got to run out of the trees. And you a lot of looking around, a lot of scouting around, a lot of looking at lots of different locations, finding the right place. Uh, and, then, and then the construction itself, which was, you know, quite a big deal. Uh, and then building, a, uh, digging this huge trench, which we lined with blue screen right. to then become the actual trench, which, you know, people could fall into. Which was awesome. Back, as if they were amazing. falling off the cliff, you know, and then you hit the blue amazing. screen, you take the cliff. That was quite fiddly. You, you plan as much as you can and you get all the tools necessary and the people and resources. Sure. And, everything, and then you go and do it. And then the X factor strikes, like the crane break. Mm. The crane's broken. Oh. It's broken, lovely. <laughs> How long to fix it? They can't fix it. Okay, lovely. Can they drag it off the field and get it out of the way? No, they can't drag it off the field. It's too heavy <laughs> and the wheels are broken. Great. So we've got a big crane in the way. Okay. What do we do about that? You know, so there's all <laughs> which did happen. So there's all sorts oh my of goodness. stuff. Oh my there's all sorts of stuff which goes down on the day and you have to go, okay. So we plan to do all this and now we've got a big lump of black metal in the way of everything. You know, what do we do about that? You know? Turn into a trebuchet. I don't know. <laughs> So, <laughs> so this did happen about a year ago, but is from you know what you can remember, how much was written down on the page? How much did you create? Because when we have talked to other people in the past, they've they've described you, even when we were talking about like the Dunholm battle, we've had people tell us, Oh, he's like a mathematician when he's oh, yeah. designing these battles. So I mean, how much did you have to create on your own and how much was written down? Well, that's a good question. Well, you know, different scripts offer different amounts of detail, but on the whole, I'd, I would say the strategy of these battles is kind of written down for you. So the basic fundamentals of, of sort of what happens, like take Dunham, for example, you know, that the commando team sort of sneak into the courtyard to try and get to the gate to open it, to let the battering ram team in, you know, the big beats like that will be written down. Sure. Then it's my job to kind of, uh, to look at all the different characters we've got and go, okay, well, they all need their moment. You know, we can't just, you know, you had Josh there, you had Hild there. I'm thinking about the team on the inside, you know, Bjorka, Hild, Ethelwald. Yeah. Um, Stay up, uh, yeah. And Stay up at Uchid, of course, you know. Yeah. And uh, Finnan, even, yeah, Finnan sneaked in, didn't he? And Citric, you know, that was the commando team that kind of got inside. And that's it. I remember, I was all coming back now. And then Ragnar sure. and Peter on the outside with the battering ram team with Clapper and whatever. You've got all these different characters and, and you know, they may not be each given a moment in the script necessarily uh you know right. some of them will you know but not all of them but but as a director i can't just kind of forget about them so i have to find little things for them to do you know and stuff like that uh, and sometimes i mean the joy of being on a show for you know a number of years and, and actually you know liking the show it is that you sort of uh for another character and you get to understand their arc and their emotional arc and stuff like that so i remember thinking that one of the things i wanted hill to do because I knew that in a couple of episodes time, she was going to give up the life of a warrior uh, because I'd read the scripts further ahead. So I thought, well, I, I need to set this up somehow now, you know, let, let's, let's start this ball rolling. So I had a, a kind of, uh, Uta runs across the courtyard to get to the gate right. and, and one of Kian's soldiers runs towards him and he sort of fights him off and then uh, leaving himself vulnerable to another soldier to attack him. And Hill comes in very quickly and kills that guy. Right, know, right. Right. You know, which of course you'd say Uhtred, and that that's a nice, sweet thing anyway. But the guy she stabs, she just does it in the in the in the moment. She looks into his mm-hmm. eyes; he's dying. Yes, he's yes. about nineteen. And she has a moment, yeah. And, and there's a little moment there, and and so f- and I had her look at him, and I said to a lovely, lovely, brilliant actress Eva Bertwist, I said, you know, you're taking this young man's life. He's never gonna. He's never going to have a family. He's never going to have kids. Oh my God. He's never going to have yeah. grandchildren. He's never going to grow old and tell stories. You're taking his life and it's all going to end now. And, and you've done, and that's, you're going to start to think then about what it is to take a human life. And then you're yeah. going to give up the life of the warrior and put your sword in your arm away and what have you. you, yeah, you, you can see the empathy on her face when she does. Yeah. That. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, she's brilliant. And, and th- then I got um, Ian, uh, you know, Bianca to just go, yeah, you know, to sort of shout out. Hill! And she goes, oh yeah. And the moment is gone. Right. And then it's off for the battle, you know, but so it's those little kind of vignettes that you can go in as a director and just kind of build and create, you know, they're not necessarily scripted, but, but, but you've got to deliver oh, cool. to everybody. And, you know, and, and, and sometimes you, 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 you kind of do more for one character than another. It depends what the, where the flow of the story is at any one moment. Yeah. And, and then of course you have to work out how you're going to shoot that and how's that's going to flow into the, the grand scheme. I mean, one of the things that as a director, I'm very um, focused on, and I think this is important for action is, mm-hmm. is geography. Like where, where is everybody? Right. Where are they going? What's their objective? Are they going? And effectively, a screen may appear to have 
depth. But it's not, it's just a flat sheet of glass, right? This computer screen. Sure. Yeah, home, it's just a flat sheet of glass. That's all it is. Because it's it's got no Z dimension, which is, you know, depth. Mm -hmm. It's only got up and down, and it's only got X and Y, right? So your characters can either go up or down, or then go left and right. <laughs> that's all they can, right. that's all they can really do, right? And they may appear to go deep, but they don't. They just get smaller. <laughs> they don't really go anywhere. You know? <laughs> they left or right. So I know this sounds a bit esoteric, but really what it boils down to is, for example, the commando team who break in, if you look yeah. at all the shots, they're all moving from left to right because the right. I, I put the gate in the middle, right? So the commando team sort of go as I'm looking at it now. I can't work out the screen direction. Anyway, no, a, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, so so so. Oh, actually, actually I can see my own screen. Okay, so the bat. So so this in now is the right. commando team trying to get to the gate to open it. You know, and over here is uh, you know is 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 Ragnar and Breeder, and they're going that way. You know, so so they're going. Sure. From, from, yeah. from, so if you look at all the shots, the entire sequence. They're all doing that. So then the audience get a sense of, are they winning or losing? You know, are, are, you know, are they managing sure. to get to where they want to get to? Or are they being pushed back? You know, and, and et cetera, et cetera, like that. And I actually chased that all the way through back into the sort of earlier on in the episode when they they, they walk to Dunham at night. And at a certain point, Uhtred and Ragnar say goodbye to one another and they right. split and the commando team go up the hill to get to the, the place where they're going to breach the wall. And Ragnar and Breeder and the battering ram team you know, go somewhere else. And at that moment, if you watch at that moment, they split. Right. From then on, every single shot, Ragnar and Breeder are always going camera left and and, uh, and, and, and Uch and his team are always going camera right. So, mm. the, so, right. You have, so that way the audience kind of keeps a sense of where everything is. Without the answer to where everything is, you can, you can have no jeopardy. You can have no excitement. So, sure. you know, if you show uh, uh, someone in the someone in the African bush coming out of the bush, and then they look and they see, and you cut to their cut to what they're looking at, and there's a there's a lion right staring right at them, and it's clearly a very yeah. hungry lion, and it's and it's walking towards them. <laughs> you get back to their face, you know, you go, oh my god, how how tense. But actually, unless you have some shot which tells you how close they are to each other, you know, I mean, the lion's hey. ten. Feet, yeah, you get why he's terrified, right? But then you, have, you can have another shot. You know, it's two hundred yards away. But it's okay. He's got his gun. It's going to be fine. You know. So, so you've got to know space, distance, proximity, sure. you know, all that stuff. Geography. It's, it's vital. Without it, you've got no sense of jeopardy and, and and rising jeopardy and stuff. So, so just going back to the directorial input, I have to design all that. And that's my job to kind of design all that and, and to work out the shots which are going to articulate that in the in in the clearest, most lucid and expressive fashion. You know, it's, it's a way to be clear, but you want to be you want to be exciting with it. As far as like the season five battle, then the, the cliff was already like yeah. in the script then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, one one thing we did here that was sort of an add on to that battle is when Constantine, King Constantine is going to lead the mm. charge out. He takes a knee and mm. does sort of like a prayer sort of mm. or meditation or mental visualization something amazing it was like again that was one of our favorite moments from the entire series uh oh. just just that moment <laughs> just can you tell us maybe like what what brought that up and well, how'd you go from there i can't remember if that was in the script or not i kind of think it was i, can't, I actually can't remember that i'm, I'm sorry to say uh, but R rod hallett who played that character it, 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 he's a superb actor uh, he's, very, he's a very lovely I mean, despite what you see, he's actually a very gentle, sensitive individual. <laughs> he's very, <laughs> the actor, so he can become this steely warrior, sure. terrific guy. But he, he, he just, you know, he just understood that. You know, as a director, you just whisper little things. You know, you, you just, you just whisper, you just whisper ideas. Really, you know, you just whisper really? little okay. ideas, and sort of, um, you and your men may never come back from this. You know, you're going to go through that door, and it's maybe oh. your, it's maybe your last moment on earth. You know, so you're going to pray for victory, sure, but are you going to are you going to do anything else? Are you going to say to God, "Be sorry for your sins"? What are you going to do? You know, I don't know. It's up to you. You just you just drop. <laughs> That's drop, awesome. You just drop little ideas in, and then the actor will go. You know, the actor will use some of them and not others. And that's fine. You know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Sure. It's just it's a sort of what will drip down into their psyche and their soul, perhaps, and kind of resonate. Yeah. And then a good actor will allow a channel for that whatever else to kind of emerge and I, I think if you look at his close-up there some quite interesting stuff's going on you know behind oh, yeah, the art totally. oh, yeah. um, I mean, he's a great actor you know and, and great acting is about allowing really sort of quite mysterious forces inside of one to speak you know and, and not being frightened of that and kind of obviously right. 
you try and shape a performance, but also as well as shaping something, you also as an actor have to kind of allow the alchemy of the soul and the spirit to kind of just manifest at times. You're not quite sure what's going to come out. And that's really great. That's we're brave acting. And and uh and you see a lot of that on this show actually. You know, Alexander Draymond, of course, who plays Utrid as you know, he's always uh amazed me with his courage as an act. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? At the end of that episode 10, we have this moment where he goes to the battle battlements and and sort of looks out oh. and has a sort of um reverie of going back over the journey that took him there you know that got him there and stuff you know and, and the losses and the wins and stuff and, and that was something that we worked on a, a lot I knew it was only going to work with an actor who would be prepared to kind of put their ego to one side and let whatever happen happen you know uh, you know sure. in, in, emotionally and I think you see with Alex what a gutsy brave actor he is because you know, for those of you who don't know, you know, when when a, when a great actor is is sobbing with grief, uh, right. it's it's real. It's not, you know, it's not all fake. You know, not pretending to sob with grief. No, no, no. They're actually finding something about which they grieve themselves, and they're tapping, sure. in, they're tapping into it, and they're offering up to the audience, you know, a, a, as a sort of exemplar of what human behaviour is. You know, a, a, and that's why the best actors are really gutsy because most of us oh, go right. through like, hide our emotions you know for, or at least right, you know right. or, or at least be guarded to a certain degree you know yeah. and, and to actually earn your living by going okay here's the most painful thing i can think of about myself and it's maybe even yeah. quite shameful and i'm going to offer it to the camera you know and and that's gutsy acting and he did that amazingly there but you think yeah. the actors who are prepared to go to these places to pull off those kind of scenes you know if it, if it was someone who was more guarded then you, all the clever editing and montaging in the world wouldn't have made you feel anything totally. it's because you had a real response to it, you know. So I was, I was just off camera whispering, you know, Giesler, you know, the joy of Giesler. Wow. Yeah, uh, you know, oh, I'd Giesler. say, you know, digging up your baby, you know, digging oh, up. Oh my god! You know, I just, I just said so, these little words, you know, and then he would just have a response to it, you know. And so did you know already those flashback scenes, like for sure yeah. what he was going to be yeah, seeing yeah, yeah. at that yeah, point? We'd, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd, I'd sat down with Alex and we'd made a, I'd, I'd made a preliminary list, and mm -hmm. um, which I thought was, because uh, I knew it, it wasn't just going to be the greatest hits of Last Kingdom, because a lot of those aren't to do with his character, you know, that would have been silly. So I thought, it's got to be about his journey to right. get to be the Lord of Bebenburg. You know, what, what's the, you know, what's it taken, the cost of it, you know, the joys and the losses, you know. And um, so I, I made a list of those and I know the show well, so I could do that. And then um, and then we sat down I, 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 as so I presented that list to Alex and I said, OK, what do you think here? You know, and he, and he went, oh, yeah, hang on. Oh, what about Santa? You forgot. I went, oh, yeah, OK, let's put that in. And, and no, we don't need that. No, that's, that wasn't that emotional. Let's get rid of that. You know? So, so we, we arrived at a kind of a list where we knew it would be a, a sort of a cathartic journey for him to go on in memory. You know, the way we did it was I just lined up the cameras and uh, he said, quite right, I knew, he said, I could, I, you know, I'm only going to do this once. You know, so, so let's get it, you know, let's wow. get it first time. You know, so let's let's not have somebody after us go, oh, is that a focus? You know, it's got to be like, you know, we've got to get this, you know. And uh, yeah. so we had two, two cameras on him, uh, two different shot sizes. And I was just very close to him. I wasn't actually looking at the monitor. I, I didn't need to. I knew what the shots were. I, I was just next to him. Out, out, you wow. can't see it was down like that. And so he could just hear my voice very quietly. And I would just, and I had the, I had the little list in my hand on a tiny bit of paper like this. And I was, you know, sure. just, my crib sheet, you know, and I was just saying, okay, so let's go, you know, so this, that, now this, you know, the joy of that, the pain of so-and-so, you know, and sometimes uh -huh. I would change my voice so I, I, I would, you know, I, I would sort of, well, I, I don't do it if you know, it's kind of embarrassing, but, no, but, yeah. well, no, but uh, I, I would sort of just try and, I would try and, you know, say, you know, um, the relief of, 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 of Ethel fled. And what I meant by that was finally finding your soulmate. Yeah, sure, sure. That's who she really was. You know, he had mm -hmm. passion, he had love, and he had joy with other people, but she was his soulmate. And that's mm -hmm. a different type of relationship. So I had to sort of somehow say her name, you know, with uh, because it's a relief to find your soulmate, right? I mean, it is yeah. because you, got, you know we battle through life and it's tough, and you know, and and then you find someone who you really understands you, genuinely understands mm -hmm. who you are, 
a human being, that's a relief. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. As well as joy, as well as a happiness, as well as this and that. It's also a relief. Like, oh God, I don't have to struggle to make myself understood anymore. Because you get me. Yeah. You actually get me. You know, you get on a yeah. deep level. You know. So you, I had to I, I knew that's what I wanted. So I, I had to say the, her name in a way which evoked <sighs> relief. Yeah. And if you see his performance. Oh, sure. There's a, you know, capture. So it was a lovely, um, in fact, I can't talk about this much more because I'm getting upset. I mean, no, it, was no, a it's... Emotional, it was a very emotional moment uh, for me and him as director and oh, actor. Cool. We're, we're friends, you know. It was a very emotional moment. And, and, and for that reason, I was really glad that, that, you know, talking about which show you end up directing, which I was glad yeah. that, the day that I, I was able to share that. That's, that was what, that's what I mean, especially and, now that I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm so glad that, you wound up doing these blocks because you know colby had said how you directed a lot of our favorite moments from the entire show i'd say a lot of our favorite moments from the entire show you know and that season happened in that episode Um, totally and just like that the moment you're pointing out there when he's reminiscing that was awesome i heard that you uh proposed that moment too did you come up with that idea yeah it was something which we we were looking we were trying to work out how to end it and um i was talking with the producer uh nigel uh the the executive producer nigel and and the producer matt and we were sort of just kicking around like how are we going to finish this you know what are we going to do and then uh, i just had this sort of just popped into my head i thought maybe what we should do is just have a kind of because the, I, I knew the audience would want to be able to reflect upon the journey. Yeah. And, and I thought to myself, well, actually, the character would want to reflect upon the journey. You know, once you've finally got to where you, you know, there's a big battle. It made you know, so much battle. sense, yeah. I think what it was, was that I was, I'd been reading the script and there was this moment when it rained and put the fire out. Oh, and, one of our um, favourites. And it just said, you know, the rain comes and that's it. And thank goodness the rain. And, and I, when I read it, I remember thinking, well, if I was Utrecht, and that's kind of, as a director, what I do, I go, well, no, I'm, I'm John East, but if I wasn't John East, if I was that character, you know, yeah. what, what I would do is I'd probably break down in tears because it's like, you know, thank F for that. I finally got I finally, I finally, I finally, And also it's a kind of, and again, it's relief again, isn't it? I mean, it's interesting that word comes up again now, but I think it, it, relief is a justifiable emotion at the end of whatever it is, 50 episodes, you know, you finally get uh, to where you yeah. get to, you know, you're going to be relieved you finally got there. Right? Totally. So if you're in battle and you're holding yourself, you know, and, and you're struggling and you're wanting, you're suppressing all of your worry and fear that it might not come off. You just like fighting to get there. And then when the rain came, it was like, oh, I can let go. And oh, of course, man. you know, the, the, then the, the tears of relief, of gratitude, uh, can all flow and they were, they were different tears to the tears he expressed on the balcony you know when he's looking out at the sea totally. you know, on the battlements rather you know uh, that was a, you know that there was a sort of a physiological catharsis of that rain and like oh thank god and, and and then of course the legs collapsed because you know the energy life energy is pulsatory you know you know we expand with aggression and we sort of shrink with fear and you know it, it, i mean anything that doesn't yeah. pulsate isn't alive that's how you know stone's dead because it doesn't pulsate you know it, right. it, life is pulsation so and, and energy moves out to enable you to be like this and then it sort of shrinks and, and you know and so the legs collapse when you're ugh, you know and that's why you knelt and yeah. it's more just a physiological like oh god it's over you know thank god and the and the tears are just a ugh, kind of a relief thing you know oh my god yeah so i'd read that and i'd already imagined that in my mind and and so then when we was thinking about how to end the show i, I remember sort of thinking well you know he's he's had this cathartic sort of physical moment but now there needs to be a sort of an emotional catharsis as well as a physical catharsis right. and, and so that's sort of where I think that's where you know as much as we ever know where our ideas come from they come from a mysterious place don't we yeah. but but you know that, that pops in my head and may, maybe what you should do is he should relive the journey you know or what it cost him to get there you know right yeah. amazing we love the battle in in everything in that episode but I'd say it was really those emotional beats yeah. and those yeah. uh, sort of like the story payoff and that to me it just felt like the episode was like handled by someone who knew the show and loved yeah. the show because there's like you said those flashbacks how you, there was a list and th- those were all big moments to us as fans that were up right. there and i and i've seen like other shows where they'll just have like random moments like is the flashbacks I'm like what it was like uh, yeah and it had to be emotionally connected to his journey 
and um, stuff where you know you thought he's he's the sawtooth of, of life, you know, of the highs and the lows and mm-hmm. the, and, yeah. and the things we've achieved mm-hmm. and the losses, you know, and the griefs and the and the joy stuff and the wrapped around the children and the relationships and you know and the loss of Leia Fritch, you know, and it's funny. <laughs> It's very odd, you know. I don't go around uh, crying everywhere, you know. But but you know, my my work is a place, a zone where I have sure. to be emotionally intelligent and connected to my emotions and emotions of the characters. So when I talk sure. about this stuff, I it does actually come back. Putting that montage. I mean, also, you know, uh, I just want to say a quick shout out to um, you know m- my amazing editor on that show, Mike Phillips. Who I mean, I used to be a film editor before I was a director. Okay. And uh, uh, so I, I, it's a craft that I, you know, revere and appreciate and, and you know, as much as I can understand it for a number of years that I did it. I knew that without a brilliant editor, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to pull off, again, mm-hmm. that sort of a, a montage because the, the it may look simple, just I'll put some shots together with his face and stuff. But, you know, the, 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 the rhythm of that. And, and when you cut away, when you come back to him, and, and and what order you put things in, and you know, and 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 just it's all crucial to, to delivering the most amount of emotion. And we worked, we worked, and we and we worked on that montage a lot. He and I, and we did various versions of it. And it and we just couldn't quite get the we couldn't quite get the end to work. We're like, well, how do we end this? Well, how do you end this emotional thing? Because the last sort of few beats are actually rather sad. It was like death of Alfred, and and like, how do we how do we how do we get to, mm-hmm. how do we end this in an upbeat thing? And then it just we went ah oh, ah oh, ah oh, ah, oh. and it kind of I don't know whether it's him or me, but it's kind of like the as the director editor kind of beauty, you know, it's like. It, it's it's the rebirth it's the rebirth so he's christened you know you know we're, we're baptism yeah 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 so you put him down at the beginning of the montage and at the end of the montage you bring him back up again you know? yeah oh, way to episode rebirth. one too to episode you know, one yeah and, and, and oh. you've gone right back to the beginning of the story you know Amazing. and so it's like a kind of a rebirth it's like now i'm back to who i should have been i always should have been that kid who got bevenberg now i am that kid who got bevenberg but also do you remember it in that great scene, you know, brilliantly directed by Nick Murphy in episode one, season one. Yeah. When he was pushed underwater and then Bjorka was going on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. A bit worried by because he was underwater for too long and all the bubbles are coming out. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he sort of bursts up, doesn't he? And in a way, you could say that's a metaphor for his, the entire journey, which is that he'd want, he should have had Bebenberg and he was submerged in a, in a life mm. of struggle and war and battle and loss. And eventually... He gets to put his head out and go, now I'm here, now I've got Bevenberg, you know. So it's totally. sort of kind of a poetic sort of metaphor there in yeah, that. Story. That's beautiful. You know, yeah. and, that's, and yeah. that's why these sort of things have emotional power. You know, it's, it's an alchemy yeah. of a lot of different things that come together, you know, and being open to ideas and, and, and you know, open to sort of people going, oh, this and that and the other and, and cross-fertilisation and, and, and yeah, then yeah. noodle towards something which is, which is you hope. Uh, yeah, affects the audience as much as it affects you. And I think it, it affects, because I, 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 I'm in my study at the moment. I've I've put a background on because it's a mess. I don't want you to see my messy <laughs> stuff. But, yeah, but, I, I, but, you know, I, I was, you know, we were working on that montage and I was a little bit, of course, because of COVID, I was editing remotely, you know, and, and we had one version. And I remember turning my doors back. I said, come on, come on. I called my wife and I said, look at this, look at this. <laughs> I think we've got it, you know. And she looked over my shoulder at the computer like I'm looking now. We both pressed play and we looked at it and we both of us just burst into tears. Oh, <laughs> that was us. So, that was us. So, yeah, and so I think we looked, because my wife, Jay, had come out to Hungary a few times filming, you know, just to accompany me, you know, I was filming. And so we both uh, said, I think we should stop editing it there. She said, yeah, I think yeah, I think you've done it. Now. Like, Don't do it. Don't mess it anymore. Yeah, you've got yeah. it. <laughs> Incredible. But you have to test, you know, if it makes sure you have to test it ourselves, you know, so like, does it does it really make me feel something? Totally, totally. And going back to to that, the rain and the fire, it's another incredible moment. I think it works so well in the Last Kingdom because it kind of plays into that theme. Well, is it the gods that decided mm-hmm. Uhtred's fate, or is it just like with every other instant where it could have been the gods? Is it just yeah. rain that was in the forecast today? And that moment was incredible. What was it like on set that day? It's funny because the the the, the battlefield and the courtyard are like you know many miles away from each other. They're not in the mm-hmm. same place, you know. Oh, okay. So, 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 so uh, well, you've got the <laughs> the inside of the Bemberg is is in a studio, or so, a lot, not all of it, but a lot of it is inside of a studio. Then you've got the right. courtyard and the walls, the inside of the walls, somewhere else, and then you've got the battlefield 
somewhere else like you know getting a car and drive for an hour and that's, that's somewhere else and the outside of the walls are there you know so so it's all like a big jigsaw so when you film any individual any individual bit obviously you're trying to, to the audience you're trying to make the audience feel like it's all joined up in one thing and you can run from there to there and it, and it only takes a heartbeat but of course as an actor you know you have to sort of go oh yeah I remember a week ago I just ran out of that door and now I'm seeing my <laughs> now I'm seeing this in flames, right? And and I've got to right. feel and all the emotions that I just had throwing um Rick Guy. You know, you know, Rick Guy, yeah, exactly. Thank you. So throwing Rick Guy off the balcony and 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 that and that the screaming, shouting at him and 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 the impolation of him, all that's all that all that stuff which I did a week ago somewhere else. Oh, that's just happened right now. <laughs> so right, I'm, right. I'm looking at the flames, you know, and that's another director actor thing, you know, it's my job to kind of psychologically you know i mean great actors don't need much help but you know sometimes you just have to kind of just remind them like like where they were and how they were feeling and what's just well you do all that sort of stuff it's fairly standard and um so the bit where he actually breaks down in the with the rain and everything in the fire and you know that's in the story that that comes at a at a moment when his emotions are really high and pumped up and 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 my god yeah i've just i've just battled with blood and gore and and yeah, and now it's all going to burn down. You know? But but of course, when you're filming it, it's just like, oh, now we've had lunch, and I'm just going to do the fire bit now. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you got he, he has to get back to that place psychologically where he just where he is in that pitch. You know, and yeah. what that means for me is I've got to get like the rain effects and the fire effects coordinating with the SFX uh, sort of technicians, the special effects technicians, and and the camera team are operating the crane, and I've got to make sure all that is going to work. Boom, mm-hmm. you know, pretty much. And obviously, you know, you have a couple of goes to get it right. But but what you don't want is to get an actor to a kind of a fever pitch kind of place and bring them in. And then you've got to spend like an hour and a half trying to make it all work. And this, because they can't keep that level of emotion. Do you know what I mean? They, right, they, right. They've got to bring themselves to this pitch. You know, you can't stay, all right, I'm ready to go now. And you can't go, yeah, I'll get all back right. to you in 90 minutes. You know, just keep it like that. It's like, what? It's like, well, I've gone, man. You know, so you've got to, you, you, so... It, it, it's us to us, the technical team and the director and everyone else to kind of get that that machine all ready. So I go right, Alex, flames here, fires. You know, I'll I'll describe it all to him. You know, this will be a, this will be real fire. You know, and I'll show it to him in the gas jets. That will be digital fire, but you've got to still react to that. You know, and so mm-hmm. you know where all the fire is. You know, and because it can't all be real, because you, you just you know that's, you'd really burn it down, right? So so, so <laughs> you know, some bits of it are fire retarded, sort of painted with fire retardant paint stuff, sure, so you burn, sure. burn, burn, and so some of it's CG flame, some of it's real flame. Uh, and then the rain stands have to be positioned, and you know we can't test them because if we tested the rain stand, then everything would be wet. And but of course it has to start dry, so we can't even test it. It's got to work first time, but we can't test it first because that will blow it, right? The set, right. The set will do it. So there's lots of things to kind of make sure it's going to work, and then you go, okay, right, Alex, you're going to come down the stairs, you're going to come to here, and then this will happen. And of course you can't shoot every angle all at once, so you have to. I mean, I had, you know, I, I'm I'm very, you know, I've got all my shots worked out before I get to the set a long time mm-hmm. before I. Get so I know exactly what shots are and I've worked out what order we'll do them in so then you're not standing around going oh what should we do next you go okay well, I've done this now that you know bang. because you want to work quickly around the actor so that they can keep this emotional you know this this pitch sure. so that's kind of how it went down really you know just kind of went out and did the master shot and I, I, had, I can't remember that day I had two or three cameras on. I think I had I think I only had two cameras that day. So, so you know, you get, you get two shots each time, you know, and, and, and yeah, strategically yeah. work through and what have you. And you shoot the wider shots first so you can see all the rain landing. And, you know, sometimes that's difficult for an actor because, like, oh, you want me to cry and stuff, but you're not on my close-up yet. So cry a little bit, but not too much because I want to have something <laughs> left. And, and that's, always a, that's always a tricky one for actors and directors and camera sure. team because, you know, ideally you do the close-up first. But that there's a number of reasons why that 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 sometimes isn't practically possible and stuff. So right. it's, it's all uh, you know. But uh, yeah, that's just uh, it went pretty quickly actually. I remember we we it sort of that little sequence went quite quickly compared oh. to some other uh, involved more people and different things. You know. Sure, sure. Going back to just like moments as a fan too that that I was so appreciative that the show got, but it was also just a really cool. Uh, technical shot, I guess you could say, was the the long tracking shot when Edward is going through Bevenbur 
um and he's like uh, yeah. seeing him oh it's brilliant and i i just love tracking shots in general but to me it was just it was an awesome fan moment too just because it's it's everyone like just chilling out at bed and burr and mm. but there's still like something happening you know it's still edward's mm. still going through he's still a mission to go see utrid yeah um, and then his interaction like metaphors happening yeah yeah he hands off well, the cup everyone looks at yeah, him Apple's differently game. and then you yeah. see utrid up like i i just thought that was an like as a fan that was just it was just great seeing that i don't know yeah to uh, well that's again I'm, I'm really pleased you picked up on these little things but I, I remember we did seven takes of that uh it was, oh, wow. it was there's a lot of you know lots of things that can go wrong at any one moment you know and um <laughs> in fact i remember we got to, on take six you know we got right towards the end i'm like oh great we've nailed this like brilliant you know everyone's turning at the right moment and and the camera's just in the right place to see his eyes and you know because you want to get it really good right you don't want to get yeah. it okay you want to get it really good so you know so when someone turns their face you don't want to see like one eye you want to see both eyes and and you see the expression and sometimes they don't turn enough or the camera was in a slightly different place because the next door was in the way so they had to move and you didn't get the other eye and, you know, so you really want to get it perfect so you've got to like take six or something like, oh great we've got it we're right towards the end and then this <laughs> this extra uh supporting artist a lovely guy but he'd never done this before but on this for some strange reason he suddenly decided he was going to run up to king and go hooray <laughs> like, <laughs> what's that guy doing you know like no no cut cut you know it's like why did you do that you've never done that we've done six days you've never done that why have you done that now and he goes oh just felt like doing it. Okay, well, just don't oh do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you go, okay, right, take seven. Here we go. Yeah. And, and of course, we got it on take seven. But the point of that shot was, it, what I wanted to do was I wanted everybody, but you know, maybe Stuart is the one exception, but I wanted sure. everybody to kind of go, oh, mate, King, you know, King Edward, you're so wonderful. You're so great. Well done. You know, you've got the, you built England and England will now be one and hooray you and well done you and, you know, and just to make Edward go, oh, I'm so fantastic. You know, mm-hmm. like, everyone loves me. I'm the king. I just walk. People get out of my way. You know, so just to really build up that sense of how important he was and that he'd finally got England and everyone's congratulating him. And to, for him, when he looked at the party, it was about England is now one thing. I've done it. I've pulled mm. it off. You know, Alfred Zimmer, I've done it. You know, hey, hey. You know, and of course, you know. Little we, did he know. Little did he know. You know, and of course, so, so just to kind of build him up sort of, puncture him and crash him <laughs> so so again that wasn't necessarily in the script but it's just something that, oh, we've got to do we've got to pump oh, wow. him up to, to, to knock him down again you know and so that's a kind of that's a kind of input that to directors have it's like you've got the story but then how are you going to tell it you know how sure. are you going to how are you going to build and do that and all that sort of stuff and it was you know it was also fun for the audience to check in with all the other characters that they'd seen along the way you know that was kind of nice to sort of yeah yeah you just see everyone was there you know that yeah, was what i like funny. we also got that you know that the um uh, ethel Fled's daughter to be still snogging <laughs> yes yes uh kane Leff and uh Elfwin. yeah that's they're it, yeah, still yeah. Kane, Kane, that's it, yeah so like they, they had his kiss earlier on now they're still <laughs> yeah 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 that was, I just, that was funny it's like well, that's all I they're thought, gonna do now they're just gonna kiss right so, every so. character's reaction when he walks through is just so accurate to their character i mean like how steora glares at him and yeah. you know yeah. um yeah. yeah, Ethel Stan takes the cup. Aldhelm gives him a cheers. I think they like yeah, uh, it's yeah. just, if, yeah. if that was the only shot you'd seen of the show, you still could have figured out a lot of what was going on. I it's just from that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was nice to give them that little moment, you know. Yeah. Totally, totally. Now you've done several awesome battles on the show. Did you have a background and knowledge in like medieval battles or or what kind of research did you have to do to be able to execute the battles on the last kingdom? Because some of your battles are, are certainly the best that we've seen, oh, yeah. not only in The Last Kingdom, but I think in, in many and, uh, of the works we've we've seen. Yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you very much for the compliments on, on both lasses. I'm going to be really totally honest with you, sure. which is that when I first got the show, uh, which is 2016, the first time I worked on it, I did, right. a, I did a bit of reading up on the period. So I just wanted to get a feeling for how it sort of just just I didn't want my only input to be other movies that I've watched. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I wanted course, to sort of go back to the, the source material. So I did read some historical, uh, you know, some nonfiction about the period and about how they conducted themselves. I didn't, though, go into great, you know, sort of forensic detail about 
about how battles were conducted and stuff. I mean, we do have an historical advisor who, who works with a writer. Um, mm. We do have uh, amazing, I'm sure you know of him, Levente Lazac. This oh, tremendous- my God. Yeah. We've had him on. He was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that guy is just a god. You know, I mean, he's just a he's 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 a he is a remarkable individual on so many different levels. Yeah. Um uh, just a human being, he's a lovely, lovely man as well as everything else. Anyway, yeah, so, so you know, and he brings a vast amount of knowledge, you know, a, 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 along with him and stuff. But I don't think as a show, I'm gonna be honest with you, you know, we're not necessarily hung up on being absolutely 100 percent technically accurate you know sure, um, sure. um there's a number of reasons for that one of which is that ultimately you know our job is to entertain you know as, as well as inform mm-hmm. education, anything else. ultimately it, it, it's an entertainment you know and um i don't mean by that it's frivolous or, or uh, meaningless i mean i place a high value on dramatic entertainment because it's how we learn about what it is to be a human being. I mean, I'm very, right. very serious about that. That's why I got into drama. But I don't think we should we would sacrifice entertainment on the on the altar of historical accuracy because ultimately, if you're interested in, in historical accuracy and, and how things actually went down, you can read books about it or watch documentaries, and that's that that's what that sure. that's what that's what those sources are for. You know, this, and drama is sort of for something else. I mean, the funny thing is, the way I approach battle sequences is I kind of approach them to the same way as I would approach, you know, a dinner party. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I don't really have. I mean, I have a, I have a methodology that's evolved over, you know, fifty years of filmmaking. So I started in nineteen seventy two, right? So, so I've been doing this for quite a while. So, you know, so, so I've evolved a method, and I apply right. the same sort of the same method I apply to a dinner party to to a which has got like eight people in to a battle with two, two, three thousand people in. You know, I, I still sure. have the same sort of approach. Um, and, and, and I've largely already touched on that, which is to do with geography and understanding where you are and also yeah. understanding who, you know, who do you care about? You know, you may have a dinner party right. scene and, you know, you have a hero or a heroine and and you're interested in, in in their emotional psychological trajectory through this dinner party, you know, and, and, and everyone else are satellites to that individual in the same way that Ophelia is a satellite of Hamlet. You know, it's not Ophelia's story, it's Hamlet's story, right? She's just a satellite sure. of it of him so so it you know, doesn't mean she's you know not of dramatic value herself but ultimately she is a, a player in his story so in, in the same way that's how i approach a battle i go well who's who's important here you know who do we really care mm-hmm. about and and let's tell the story from their point of view now of course the, the the nature of an ensemble show like the last kingdom yes you have a central character Uhtred, but you also got the journey of alfred and the journey of edward and yeah. you know like that and so um in any big battle and, the, and the, the snow battle in episodes five and six from at three is a good example. You know, the, the perspective changes at a certain point. Mm-hmm. You go, well, up to this point, we, we care about Uhtred, but now we're going to, we, we know his predicament and his predicament is, is a, is a sort of a, we've got that box off. He's in trouble and, he, and any minute now he's going to die. Right. That's him. Okay. So now let's go over here and be with Edward and Alfred, you know, and, and, uh, and are, are we going to treat them as a, uh, as equal parts of a duo or are we going to say we're more interested in Alfred's perception of 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 uh of Edward or are we more interested in Edward's perception of his father you know so so you make those sort of choices as a director mm-hmm. and then you sort of proceed from that basis in terms of well I just have to make the camera tether for want of a better expression to this character yeah. and then look out from this tethered position to the rest of the world and I look out from over there and look out over there. And and if you do, if you doing your tethering correctly <laughs> and you're looking out correctly and your geography correctly, then I think you've got a, a, an effective battle sequence. And that's sort of how I sort of go cool. about it. Do you have a favorite battle you've directed from the show? Well, I suppose actually, you know, each time I did it, I felt I'd, I'd learned something more and I was able to apply those lessons the next time. So in, in that mm-hmm. sense, I suppose the last, you know, that, that episode 10 was my favourite because I sort of felt I was firing all cylinders directorially. And I, you know, because, I mean, I'm, I'm a terrible, well, I don't know if I'm a terrible or a good critic of my own work, but whatever it is, okay. whenever I do something, you know, the first thing I see is what's wrong with it. <laughs> go, go, why did I do uh, this? Why didn't I do that instead of this? Why have I done, why, why did I shoot it like that for goodness sake? You know, I'm always critiquing something. Oh, I've been, what are the sure. better cut from there, you know? And that's how I, and then I take those lessons and I apply them the next time and the next time, the next time, you know? And so hopefully you get better as a, you know, you, I always remember um, uh, Kira Kurosara was asked in his early eighties, someone said, uh, 
He said, Mr. Kurosawa, we, we know, when are you going to retire? When are you going to stop making films? And he said, uh, uh, when I can do it properly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, well, that says it all right there, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm not comparing myself to Kira Kurosawa, but, but I, I kind of, I, but, I, but I get that, you know, it's, mm. it's, a, it's a, everything I do, I feel I'm, okay, now I'm learning how to do this filmmaking better. And one day, maybe I'll really crack it. You know? I mean, David Lean said the same thing about Nostromo. He was, he's, he, of course, he, I think Passage to India was David Lean's last, movie you know the guy who made Lawrence Arabia and mm -hmm. Dr. Mm -hmm. and, stuff, and uh, Bridge on the River Kwai and I think he, I think he, he made Passage to India and he was setting up Nostromo which is an adaptation of a Joseph Conrad novel and he got so ill and it's at the end of his life he, you know he's in his late 80s and he realized it wasn't going to happen you know and he had to sort of abandon the project and he said uh, he said to somebody he said damn he said, I was just getting the hang of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's funny <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know you've already done blonde arabia mate you know that, that, yeah yeah that, that was just i'm just warming up you know i'm quite sussed it out yet yeah so i guess uh, sorry it's a very long-winded answer to uh, yeah. some, oh, but cool. I think the last, because I, I felt you know like i was just getting more of it how i wanted it to be you know sure, was there any sure. moment that you learned from you know one of your earlier seasons from the last kingdom or even maybe some other works you did uh while you were not working on the last kingdom that you brought to Golly, no. God, that's, a, that's a very, that's a brilliant and very penetrating question. And I'm going to struggle to, to think of a really, a re really good answer to that. Yeah. Um, so um, hmm. I might have to come back to you on that. I, no, yeah. I, I don't want to give you like a, I don't want to give you like a made up answer. I want to give you a proper, okay. a really For good sure. example. And, so, and one okay. doesn't lead to my, I mean, the funny thing is as a, you know, I mean, I, as I said, I've been directing a very long time. I've been, well, I mean, I started as a kid, right? So that was, as I say, 1972. So sure. I was just, that was my childhood hobby. And then I became a film editor and I used the money from that to, to fund my own short films. Then I became a director. So so one way or another, I've been making films for sort of 50 years. And I'm lucky yeah. that I'm to go from one job to the next, to the next, to the next. It's like a kind of a river, you know, and, and you're kind of rowing this boat down your career, you know, and this is going fast and that's going fast. And and, and now you're jumping over here and now you're meeting these people and doing that. So, so you know, I, I've never been a diarist. I don't write things. I don't write my, I don't, I don't have my memoirs, you know, so, so, it's strange that that river flows quite quickly and mm. uh, which may be a shock for anybody in their youth but believe me you wake up one day and suddenly you're 60 you go well, hang on just a minute how did that happen <laughs> i was 22 a minute ago and now i'm 60 it goes very quick life you know and particularly if you're busy these lessons that you learn they're sort of they sort of go into your bones somehow uh, you know and, and it's not something i've got codified and written down and and yeah. so this, is, this isn't a way of evading your question but it's i've never been asked that before and it's a very good question and i'm just thinking about what that means about how one learns and i guess one just sort of one sort of uh, has a sort of intuition about i shouldn't do that again i should do it like this or, or, mm. or oh i know uh, i i did i tried that last time it worked really well let me let me let me now do that again you know but I, as a specific example i am going to struggle to maybe one will occur to me yeah. carry well that, that might be tough to think of a specific example because it's just some you, you don't even realize you're doing it you know right, you right. Are I mean, right. yeah, yeah i mean I, I i teach directing sometimes you know I'm, i i do guest like a guest lecturing sure. at university stuff i'll come in for a day and do a workshop or something you know and I, well i hope my students learn something i learn enormous amounts because i'm forced to analyze exactly what i'm doing you know because they ask very penetrating questions like why did you shoot this or how would you do that and i go well you know and, and i i know the answer but and it comes to me like this and i think well hang on what why do i think that why would i do? so i'm forced to examine my own methodology you know and, mm. and, and break it down because I wouldn't say it becomes second nature after a while, but like someone said to me the other day, who's watched me direct, they said, oh, you're very intuitive. Like someone asks you a question, you just know the answer like that. And and I go, well, that's a bit of an illusion because really I, I'm, I am work, I'm actually going through a cognitive process. It's not intuitive. I'm going, should, I, should it be, you know, someone says, someone brings you a shirt. Do you want a blue shirt or a red shirt on this guy? I go, blue shirt. You know, and I, I go, wow, that's so intuitive. Yeah. Actually, no, what I've really thought of, I, in my, so I've done it so often this, the, the mental pathways become very quick, you know, so you can go, okay, so what colour is the background? 
that, that's going to be important. So, you know, we've got a red background. I don't want a red shirt with a red background. You know, that will you know, just be a floating head, right? So, so, so I, first of all, I think about what's the background, and then you kind of think, oh, hang on, well, well, what's the, what's the, what's the? But I could change the color of the background. Could I? Well, I could change it through lighting. I can't repaint really it. I'm going to have time to repaint it, but I could change it through lighting. I can make it dark or light. So maybe I could, maybe I could still have a red shirt against a red background. So what? So what about the character? You know, so so then you're going, okay, so so where's the character at the moment? Is he angry or is, is he is, is he is he chilled out? Well, what's going on? I mean, is he the sort of character? Where's the red shirt? You know, but and then and all that goes really really fast and so to the outside world it appears you're being very intuitive oh it's that color but actually your brain is going and you're working it all out right so then when people students go how do you do this or how do you do that why do that i have to kind of go oh, i don't remember now you know because yeah. it's all sort of happens in the moment very quickly you know that's why it's hard to answer that question about what lesson did you learn here and apply there because it's yeah. sort of it, it it sort of happens on a it's not entirely unconscious but it happens on that sort of threshold of consciousness and unconscious there's a uh, what, what uh, freud had a word for that state hypnagogia it's a kind of a is a place in between consciousness and unconscious where they interface and a lot of your creative thinking i think as a craftsperson often operates in that sort of liminal space between consciousness and unconscious yes so it's very very fast and, and and it can appear to be intuitive but also there's a cognitive element so so it's probably much more complicated answer than you really wanted. <laughs> I think it's a good answer. It's not just that it's not just that you didn't have enough guys falling on spikes in a ditch in uh, <laughs> season two. More spikes. More spikes. Well, that's, more... that's funny you should say that because it's funny you should say that because I do remember. Actually, that's that's really interesting you say that because I do remember when they were building those spikes and yeah. they were putting them all up. And I remember thinking at some point, oh, we better be careful when they run across it because a stunt person might fall on a spike. And then I remember thinking, oh shit, that's a really good idea. Because <laughs> 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 you know, it was, again, that wasn't in the script. Fantastic. Like, of course, someone's going to fall on a spike. Yeah, but make it, you know, then, we, then we worked out how to do it safely, you know. But uh, it, that's... <laughs> So I'm always worried awesome. about health and safety issues because I, you know, I, I, I don't want sure. to yeah. you know, pour hot oil on people and setting them on fire. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's fun yeah, stuff. I'm, and, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of health and safety. Speaking of Good. just like even, you know, from the beginning to now, but going back then to one of your yeah. earlier moments in the show, uh, one of our favorite moments, and I think one of a lot of fans' favorite moments was the moment after Uhtred in season two uh, gets off the slave ship mm. and he's mm. with uh, Hild and they're in the field. Yeah. And oh, she, yeah. she's sort of bringing him back. Yeah. No can, can you tell yeah. us about shooting that day and, and maybe any input you had that day, if you can remember? Oh, golly, what a wonderful day that was. We actually had quite a lot to do that day. Obviously, we we're shooting in summer, so that we had a lot of hours of daylight. So there's a lot of stuff crammed into that day to shoot. I remember it was, particular, it was a particular location. We couldn't get back there too easily. So we had to go there and shoot a lot of stuff. That scene obviously was scheduled for that day. The main things that stick out in my mind was, I remember that the sun was going down. I think we'd, we'd, we'd sort of tried to schedule it more or less at that time. But anyway, the sun was going down and I looked, I went, oh my God, did we, you know, we have got probably 20 minutes to shoot this because we'd been doing something else and be very complicated, that probably taking too long and, and something like that. And, and, and now it's like, look, we've got to, we've got to move. We've got to, we've got to stop whatever we're doing here. We've got to come over here now. We can, go, we can come back to that later because there's some cutaways we can do that later. But we've got to come here and do this now because the, the light is just, you know, the sun was going like, whoomph, like that. And I knew with the, we, we're going to have 20 minutes or so of, of really beautiful light and it had to be right that light because i i wanted it to be at, a, at, at that sort of place where i mean it was actually a sunset but of course we were filming it to be dawn it was him waking up sure. you know? i knew it had to be that sort of very delicate light which is gentle and soft and warm and sort of primal i suppose you know something yeah, like, yeah. Like, you know if, if if you've ever seen 2001 a space odyssey the Santa cubic movie yeah you know, it starts with it says the dawn of man the title comes up and that's the opening scene and it's set you know but it's five million years ago you know and yeah. the first shots you see are the sun coming up you know and, and there's quite a few shots of the desert with the sun and it's just getting higher and higher and, you know, and then finally you see moon watcher and the apes and all that business but it starts with that sun. You know, it's it's it, it's very much to do with birth of, you know, the, the, you know the, the the sun coming up. It's like a new dawn. It's you know, it's about his resurrection. You know, um, he's now going to come back from this dark mm. nightmare of being a slave, right? So the light's important. So we had to get it while that you know. So it's like, quick, get over here now, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> I, was, right. I, probably, I probably did become a bit prescriptive. Like, right, you sit there, you sit there. We're going to do this right now. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and warmth like that. And um, we did a little bit with first with him waking up with the with the with the sort of I wanted him to wake and oh, well, that's another whole crazy story. We had a yeah, that was he, in the script. He wakes up and and he sees a deer looking at him, and then the and then he sort of he makes a move and the deer bolts off into the distance and then while the deer disappears then hill comes and sits down and watches him and stuff we, we had this um <laughs> you, like, you can't we <laughs> you can't work with real deers right i mean you can film deers in the distance right and, and you put them in a cage i suppose if you were really cruel you know we wouldn't do that you can film deers and you know there's but you can't work with a deer like you can work with a dog or a cow or something because they're okay. skittish nervous delicate creatures right and you could you know you risk traumatizing them and distressing them and injuring them and you know so so you can't do, we thought well, how are we going to do this okay well we don't have enough money for a digital deer right so if you're watching golden compass or some harry potter movie that they'll, they'll just create the deer digitally right but we don't have that kind of money so we we, <laughs> we found a stuffed deer right and it looked really real this thing because it just <laughs> stuck stuffed it so, so we put this stuffed deer there and i thought we do have enough digital effects that we can make it blink and we can make its ears twitch right sure. and we can make its chest expand and contract a little bit that's a 2d visual effects quite cheap so we can probably make it look alive and then what i was going to do was he was going to sit up and there'd be a sound of hooves going and then i was going to cut to some archive stock footage i had of a deer running away across his field and it would have all worked right sure um, and we actually shot all that. We shot the deer. We shot everything. Although in my heart of hearts, I was thinking, I'm not sure how good that's going to look. But anyway, we, we, we filmed it. And then I was filming him lying down. And I said, let's, let's get some shots of you like waking up. Effectively, he sort of just, his eyes woke and he looked up. And I said, and I'd said something like, just feel the earth. You know, just feel the, feel nature around you. So he reached up to touch this long grass. And as he reached up, we were on a close-up. This dragonfly came and hovered around his hand like that, mm. and then just flew away. And that was just that was just unplanned. It just happened, right? And as soon as I saw that, I thought, "Ah, oh, great! We won't need that stupid stuff, dear." Because <laughs> 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 that's as much communing with nature as you need, right? I mean, it effectively, right. oh, yeah. life had come. It was even better, really, because life yeah. had come to him and had hovered around him and just sort of gone away so it was like life was coming into him again yeah it's all oh, better wow. for filmmaking you know good filmmakers all symbolism imagery and stuff yeah yeah for me that that was enough symbolism you know didn't need the deer anymore and then hill came over sat down and i say we had 20 minutes the light was going and i had two cameras set up normally you, you try to avoid cross shooting cross shooting is when you shoot two cameras both pointing yeah. different directions like you know so one's on one actor one, it's like that's how you shoot friends or it's a sitcom right sure, so, sure. Yeah, but then then the lighting's always compromised but because we all because we i just arranged them such that the backlight was was coming in a particular way we didn't it didn't really hurt the lighting so so we had two cameras and, and like two sizes like mid shot close up done you know that's what we had right. time for the sun was going down like that right? and that was it and and they had spoken about the sea that they don't rehearse as such. A rehearsal is a is a you know different different directors will have different attitudes towards rehearsal, and and you know uh, uh, they're all valid really. Whatever works for you, and that's you know the way I look at it. Um, yeah. My preference is to talk about the what what the actors want out of us, you know, what, what the characters want, you know, what are they, what are they trying to accomplish, and, and what obstacles are in their way. That's what I try and say. Right. Like, this is what this is what the character wants. These are the things that stopping them get it. And we talk about that, and then I like just them to just to do it on camera, sure, you know, and not kind of rehearse, 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 and then shoot it because you often you've lost something ineffable, you know. But there's lots of different ways you can go about it. But that's my style, yeah. and so that's how I approached it. We talked a bit about a bit about we, we had already talked about it a bit uh, before we got there that day, and so they kind of knew where they were headed. Those two actors, and they're great with each other, and they're, you know they're oh, great. Yeah. Actors by themselves and they're great with each other and they have great chemistry and so it's just like off you go wow go you know and it was it was one take two takes that's cool they were they were on it you know and it was very emotional tender you know that's cool. Yeah. it's cool you get to have like that moment with hill and then like you talked about her other moment in in the battle of dunholm and then you get to have her reprise her warrior ways oh, yeah, in, yeah. in the last episode oh, uh, which that, was really kind was... of special yeah, I'm, I'm going to claim credit for that because that, that last moment, I knew 
she had to kill some, because she did, in the original script she didn't kill anybody she just like ah, just ran away oh, cool. and I said no, no she's got we've got to take her on the end of, to a journey here you know yeah. because otherwise there's no cost to her to being involved in this exactly. and the cost of her is she's done what she prayed she'd never do again which is kill somebody you know right. and um, so we worked out that little fight where she kills that guy in the in the corridor you know uh, and the way she asks him not to grab the sword because she doesn't yeah. want to do it. Yeah, want to do it, but uh, yeah. he does, and she has to do it. Yeah, um, it was cool. And, and uh, speak- that was a nice little journey for that character, actually. Oh, totally. Yeah. Speaking of of great journeys, and just another side quest in season three that we absolutely oh, yeah. loved was with when Uhtred and Brita have their mission, sort of like a side hmm. mission where they're actually it's important to the story, but they go and find story. Yes. And we just love this so much because it's the first time that Brita kind of showed any understanding of Uhtred. And the first Mm. time Uhtred actually got to like explain himself to Brita for why he hasn't joined them. Could you talk about just a little bit about that sequence? Um, I know it was a longer part of the episode. Gosh, yes. Uh, How interesting to pick on that. Yeah. I mean, I I love their relationship. I have to say, I thought it was, uh, I I will talk about that, but just just, just very quickly to say, I thought it was brought to a brilliant conclusion um, when they fought in the the, the ruins of of their child. Loiters. Yeah. yeah, that that was Incredible. phenomenally, uh, you know, brilliantly orchestrated. Um, you know, it's brilliantly written, it's, it's brilliantly conceived, it's brilliantly written, it's brilliantly acted, it's brilliantly directed, it's brilliantly shot. You know, I took my hat off to you know that was such a beautiful way to end that 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 journey. Yeah, so so tender and true. You know, and one of the things I like about the Last Kingdom is there's very few real villains as such. You know, true. I mean, even, even the most villainous characters. Are, are properly motivated. They're not, you know, they're not moustache twiddling, you know, mel- melodramatic villains. You know, you know, they're, they're, they've got proper reasons for, you know, you know. I mean, Keaton. I mean, you know, his son was a, he wasn't a very nice boy, but he was blinded. You know, was, right. was, of course, he, you know, you'd feel you know, pretty cut up about it. You know, you know, there's always, you know, even the dark-hearted villains had sort of their reasons and stuff, and, and even sure. go back to one with, you know, with um. Uh, um Good, good, good through through him. And, yeah yeah yep. exactly in, in, in the end yeah and, and that wonderful thing in the end when he got baptized in the river you know after after having you know shot jason fleming full of arrows and <laughs> innocent <laughs> son sebastian way you know, you know and in the end he gets baptized you know he, he goes on a real journey you know so, so, so I, I like that and, and the breeder utrid thing coming back to your question is, is is one of the most interesting emotional journeys i think in the whole series mm. and both those actors emily uh, and alex you know be, you know became you know i felt very close to them on this uh, journey and and uh, warmed them a lot and and that particular episode where they go off in hunt hunt Stura was so rich in in, in sort of uh, emotional sort of resonances in terms of you know she, she, you know he, this man was the reason why she didn't have children you know i mean that's right right such a primal, primal thing that, you know, or can be such a primal thing, thing that, you know, um, what she desperately wanted, you know, to, to be a mother and a family. And this, this, this man had supposedly cursed her and prevented all of right. that, you know. So she was on that desperate mission to, to lift that curse on that journey. She, the, 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 it's like a little odyssey for, for the two of them, isn't it? To kind of recapitulate mm-hmm. all the things totally. that brought them together. And th- there was two moments I thought, which were, you know, for me, there were great scenes to shoot, which is that on the way, on the way there, they 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 have a campfire at night, don't they? Yeah. They sort of come to terms with what each has meant to the other, you know. Right, right. Um, and, and they sort of they sort of cuddle and some tears and stuff. And again, a very emotional moment, very emotional scene to shoot. And so you see this kind of real bond, you know, it's, it's painful for them, you know, and she pulls away from it at a certain point, but but they sort of admit to each other how deep their emotions for each other were, you know. Right. And and then by the end of the episode, they have another sort of meeting where they sit on two rocks very similarly, you know, close at night, you know, and and yet it's much more, if you remember at the end, it's, it's much more snowy and, and cold mm-hmm. and, and, and they sort of end with her saying, I'll meet you on the battlefield and I'll kill you. Yeah. And and there's a kind of inevitability and a faithfulness about that, which he sort of has to accept. And they sort of turn away from each other. And the camera kind of, I don't know how I did this, but they sort of, 
you know, when two people are sort of like this, you sort of focus, you know, you have somebody in the foreground and you focus on the person in the background and, and vice versa. And that's how you do those sort of over the shoulder shots. And then at the end, they turned away from each other to look out in profile at, you know, same side of Frank. And then a camera on both sides pulls focus to the foreground. Hmm. So they're both in the same two shot, but now they're looking away from each other and, and the focus is in the foreground or the background. So it's like they've become separated from that person. The other person's become like a ghost to them in a way, you know, and, sure. and so it has a very, very sad that I felt, you know, yeah. that, and that, that happens in life. You know, there, there, there can be moments mm-hmm. when people who love each other just can't be with each other anymore and can't stand each other. And, you know, and, and, and also vice versa where people who, who have had, who have had antipathy find out that beneath the antipathy is a lot of love, you know, and, and so yeah. in, you know, kudos to wonderful Bernard Cornwell sort of novels, you know, from all from which all this sprang. And and then the script writers who, you know, who sort of navigate into that emotional material and the actors who can who who want to go on those journeys. Because to me, the re- that's the main reason I love The Last Kingdom is because they're human stories. Yes, they're great battles, yes. and it's great fun, but they're it, it's got something to say about what it is to be a human being, you know, and that's that's totally. the best. Drama. Yeah. And another moment too, down back from season three, speaking of human moments and of somebody battling sort of a sickness and then having to get on a horse oh, yeah. and lead men on a, um, and hold up the sword when Alfred, oh. mm. it's one of the most incredible moments of the show. Yeah. Um, it just gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Could you just maybe touch real quick on, on what it was like to shoot when Alfred gets on the horse? He's, he's well, heavy with yeah. chain mail and has to hold yeah. up that heavy sword. Yeah. Well, David Dawson, of course, is just a staggeringly good actor. I mean, I, th- I think, you know, so many of the cast were sort of, you know, <laughs> a bit in awe of him. You know, it's like, no, we've heard that a lot. We've heard that a lot. Yeah. Good. You know, and, and all, you know, and that's great because it makes everyone else raise their game. It's like, oh my God, I've got to sure. see it today. I've, I've, I've got to be really honest. That's what they all I'm, say. Yeah. 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 Throw me off the screen otherwise. You know? <laughs> Actor, you know, and and there's something interesting because really, uh, in that particular moment, he had nothing to act against. I mean, I mean, the best advice, you know, give actors. Well, there's all sorts of advice you can give actors, you know, and as they learn their, their craft. But one of them is to, you know, the eyes of your, the eyes of the person you're acting against, are, are, you know, are, are, is where the scene is. You know, that's kind sure, of it's, yeah. it's about how you connect to the other person's eyes and 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 you know, as in life, when you feed off micro changes of expression and, and you know and hard stare and soft stare and pleading and you know all this stuff and 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 there he is but he hasn't got anything it's just him on a horse right <laughs> you know and a, and right. a crowd and a, and a crowd of people and again of course the crowd was only half as big as it looked because we digitally copied people and moved them around and you know right, so. right. So even what's in front of him wasn't really what's in front of him you know so it all has to be conjured in his mind in that scene I, i'm trying to remember now i think we'd shot I think we'd shot the scene of him putting on the chain mail first. You know, because there's there's two types of chain mail we have on set. There's there's the stuff which is made out of plastic, which you can wear all day long. Sure. Uh, because and then there's real chain mail, which is made out of metal. And they look pretty much the same on camera, you know, apart from yeah. extreme stuff. But but you know, you couldn't really wear a, 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 a proper suit of chain mail all day long. You know, you you'd right. I mean, I mean, it's amazing that these guys actually really did wear that stuff back yeah, in the middle yeah, of the time. Yeah. But, but, you know, it, I mean, it's incredibly heavy. If you ever picked up real chain mail, oh, I mean, yeah. a chain mail tabard, you know, which is the long tabard with the sleeves and everything like that, it's like really heavy. Like, totally. Like that. So we'd shot the scene with him putting it on. And, and uh, I'd said to David, you know, are you okay if we put the real chain mail on? Because I, and he said, absolutely, let's go for it, you know, because, and it is heavy. So, so, we'd, so he'd felt the weight of it. And and you know and uh, you, you may even remember that scene you know and, and he puts the crown on it and there's a close yeah. over his head going on like that and, and I said I said Look, you're ill right so you're weak and not only that but your skin it probably feels like you know everything that touches it is like oh, ow ow you know that you mm. didn't get that sometimes when your skin's really sensitive and and like things touching it like are just a bit painful and tender so, yeah so, yeah yeah. That's just how your body. So when they put the crown on, so I did that close up, you know, and you see his pained face, and I don't even remember that, but he tries to sort of stand upright, you know, like this. I've got to be a king. I've got to look good, you know, like that. There was one bit when I was, <laughs> I was pulling on the bottom of the chain out of the shop. I was pulling on the bottom of the chain mail to make it really, you know, you know it and right? so. <laughs> oh, I was actually I was at the end of the shop. <laughs> 
I was going to say, every time something went on him, it looked like he actually sank down, you know? Yeah. But that's yeah. because it's you just pulling him down. <laughs> but it's, it was, it was, I wasn't there all the time. There's one moment where I actually did just, I just wanted him to, wanted him to strain more, you know? But we shot that first. So he had that sort of somatic memory of, of the weight of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Also, we have fake swords and we have metal swords. You know, we have the fake swords are made of, of uh, um, some sort of plastic resin material. Sure. You know, so you don't hurt each other, you know? Uh, so, uh, but we also had real swords and, and we got the heaviest sword we could get, you know, so it, it you know, that it was going to, oh, you know, and so he's such a brilliant actor. He can just sort of bring the somatic memory of, of all that chain mail, the, the weight and the pain and the weakness of it all. And he can bring the, mem the emotional memory of one scene and take it into another scene and use that physiologically to sort of make him kind of, you know, sort of vibrate and incredible stuff. brilliant actor just a brilliant brilliant actor really who who is top of his game you know it's phenomenal wow did, those were we've had so many favorite moments like we said with you directing did you have any favorite moment from the show that you worked on or or even mm -hmm. maybe you watched as a fan or anything like that well i mean you did touch on one with hill in the field i i i love yeah. doing that and it was so simple and true you know to, to you know to sort of you know the, the emotion the emotion of the characters and so, so I, I really love doing that i did love the sort of challenge of trying to work out that cliff edge and how we were yeah. going to do that because that was it was so i remember when i read the script thinking how the hell are we gonna, are we yeah, gonna yeah. do this? you know and I, lots of ideas went through my head but i thought whoa this is this is going to be really Okay, let's let's think about this then. You know, and sure. and you know, there's a lot of time spent working out. And you've seen all my storyboards and concept drawings and stuff. You know, and and I did really enjoy um, getting getting to that. And also, there are just certain shots where you just think, oh yeah, that's a cool shot. You know, you think you, you just yeah. think, oh, that, that nailed it. Funny enough, when Uhtred and the and the Scots army sort of come out of the forest and sort of attack the uh, um, uh, sorry the, the, the uh, Viking the Danes come out of the forest and attack the rear of the Scots army on the cliff edge yeah and yeah. and they sort of release the pressure on Edward's army and Edward's army who have all been falling off the edge finally get to sort of push back away from the cliff edge there's a kind of a crane shot which sort of comes down which I, I didn't I didn't kind of an establishing crane shot when they were being pushed to the edge and I kind of craned up and yeah, looked yeah. Over. And then when they all rush away from it, we did the reverse crane move like that. So then we sort of came down to meet them as they were running away from the edge. And cool. and Alfred, uh, uh, sorry, Edward, Edward and Ethel Sands sort of run towards the camera like that in a sort of craning down shot. And then we cut to this very low angle camera, which we did separately, of course, um, looking up at Edward's face as he races past the camera going, yes, <sighs> yes. In, in slow motion, you know, like that, you know, Amazing. finally I get, you know, I get away. And I just really love that low angle slow action shot of Timothy because he just, he did it so brilliantly. And it's just sometimes just, you know, he was really sprinting, right? And yeah. so we were, we were running at like 120 frames a second. So, so he just ran past like that. And we didn't really have time to do that again. I said, well, let's, I hope that'll turn out okay. And then of course, then I saw the rushes. I went, yes, it's a brilliant shot of him. And the focus puller had really got the, you know, was turning the focus. I mean, well, I'm doing it slowly, but of course, in reality, he just whoosh, so the focus pull had to go off, <laughs> yeah, like that to right. get it in focus, and you know, and it just sort of came off, and it's and it's like, yeah, that's a really cool shot. <laughs> so, that, was, that was an awesome moment. Yeah, that was incredible. That was incredible. And and we'll we'll wrap it up here soon. Here, John, we don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, just one other question about now that the show is wrapped up, kind of. What are your feelings how that it's out? And by the way, we think you absolutely crushed the ending. We think it was amazing. We, we couldn't really imagine. We were, we were nervous going in because it's our favorite show. Oh, how is it going to end? Is it going to leave a bad taste? No, it, it was just just right. It was awesome. Okay. Um, but how are your feelings now that it's out and, and done? Well, it's funny. I was, I was just um, because it is nearly a year ago that we wrapped shooting that. Uh, I was reflecting on this just just the other day. I didn't know you were going to ask me that. I was reflecting on this the other day with my with my wife, who, as I mentioned earlier, she she came out to um, stay in Budapest with me while I'm filming out there. And you know, and you're over there for like several months, you know, at a time or four or five months at a time. And we were just sort of reflecting that, you know, it was a great journey for us as a couple. You know, that, that every few years we'd go out there and we'd meet all our friends and the crew and producers and the actors again and you know and you'd shoot and work long hours and then you'd hang out maybe and have a drink in the evening and go to a bar and a restaurant or something you know there was a kind of a social side to it as well so for me personally you know it wasn't just 
uh, the life on the screen. It was also my own personal life, you know, that, that, that I spent, you know, from 2016 to last year, you know, sort of five years of my life was given over, you know, in, in, in chunks to this thing. I'm, and I'm really glad you like the end of it. I, I, I thought so much, so long and hard about how to end it properly. But you know, there, there is a there's a sort of sadness. That I, I won't oh, be going. Yeah. Back, I won't be going back there. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a there's a some chance I might be going back to do another couple of shows in Budapest next year, maybe the year after. So, but um, but you know, it's but that particular time of my life's now finished. You know, sure. and sure. the friendship continue. You know, and I still you know I speak to Alex and I speak to others. You know, which I'm very lucky to do. But um, it w- it was a really beautiful time of my life. I really enjoyed. Very rewarding. Very hard work. Extremely hard oh, work. Yeah. Very and i'm sort of I'm, I'm very touched that you remember these bits of the show from different parts of the and, and there's so many more by the way if we had yeah, uh, more time of, be, there's so many more you sort of it, it, it's just gratifying that 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 you know sort of it, it, it's not completely it lives on as it were do you know yeah, what I mean? it, yeah. it, in the audience those moments live on in the audience and, and and hopefully new fans will find it in the future and and what have you, you know so it's yeah it's been a very gratifying and rewarding period of my life and i'm, I'm a bit sad it's over but uh, i look back on it immensely fondly you know? i think this will be a show that it grows more and more in time and i think this will be something like a major cult classic you know when we're talking I hope so. yeah decades it, out it deserves to be there's so much in it and there's so much in it for so many different people because there's so many different characters different relationships that that you know that i think it touches different people in different ways you know in terms of it, when you come to it you know you can relate to it in different ways and kudos again to the, to, to, to bernard cormel and the writers for, for infusing it with so much sort of variety emotional variety you know yeah yeah and thank you so much for all the hard work we know you put a ton of hours a ton of time a ton of heart into the show and we appreciate it um anything new coming out that you just want people to know about from yourself any new works and coming out here in the near future? well um yeah i mean there's the, the a couple of shows that i finished shooting now which haven't yet dropped uh so we've got uh, pennyworth three season three yep. is coming out on hbo uh i'm not sure when but uh, sometime soon we hope and uh, that was great fun i love i've done all three seasons of that show and i love working on that it's lovely team lovely actors great writers as producers i mean it's just it's just a joy to work on that show and, and it's great fun we all enjoy that and then um i just finished shooting and i'm just i'm just doing the sound mixing now of a show called bloodlands it's the second yep. season so it's a bbc show so uh i guess it's on this in the states uh i'm not sure acorn or something like that I, i'm not sure wh- who it's with but it, it is over in the states somewhere great. and it's a it's the cop it's a cop thriller set in northern ireland um Ooh, cool. thing with uh, lots of mystery and bloodshed and emotion and tears <laughs> fantastic <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to that for sure yeah My pleasure thanks again john for for talking with us today this was awesome like colby said we yeah. probably could have talked to you for like eight hours you know but you know we don't <laughs> want to wear you out so thank you again for this and and thanks again from us as the fans and and yeah. uh make sure everyone check out his social media so you can see it behind the link stuff we'll have that linked in the description below and in his imdb so make sure you check out see his upcoming work because this was a lot of our favorite moments and episodes were directed by this guy and and uh, make sure to check that out uh, do you have anything to say to the fans then john is there anything you well I, you know i mean uh, as alex has said the reason it, it kept getting renewed you know for season after season was because there was the audience was there for it and and they, they're not only their numbers but also their in you know their sort of allegiance to it their emotion their response to it was so positive and uh, it was a pleasure to serve them you know we'll that's they're always the first thing in our heads really is it's, it's like you know how can we how can we make the story as compelling and as engaging and as relatable as possible so uh, the fact that they responded to it so positively that's a joy for us and we're very grateful for that that's awesome. awesome thank you john and thank you for everybody uh, who listened uh, again we're the screen chronicles and we hope that you follow and, and subscribe to our channel um but for now we're going to say goodbye Bang. John East and the Screen Chronicles. So, Destiny, Destiny is all. Is all.